Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Go ahead. Ready. Right, welcome everyone to Harvard CMA the Quantum Matter Seminar Series. Uh, we are delighted to have a Cameron and the Leo people at uh, MIT and Harvard who talk about their recent work. And some of you might be attending the talk by Ryan Strongren earlier in the morning. And I think this will be a even more detailed uh, the talks by the young physicists and mathematicians. So let's welcome Cameron and Leo. Yeah, well, please. Yeah, well, yes, Cameron is sitting with you right now. So how we're gonna do this talk is I'll be talking for the first half, so like this 55 minutes or so, and then camera will pick up our work. Okay. So I want to begin with thank you so much for coming. So this is joint work with Arun Sanat and Kalia and Ryan. Okay. And yeah, so as Ryan gave a talk in Simji Summer this morning about it, and I think we'll we'll go through a more mathematical approach around the same content, a little bit more efficient. Okay. Great. So let's try this. Okay, so before I get started, I'm gonna just quickly talk about the outline. So I'm responsible for part one, and okay, part two. And in part one, the entire goal is just to introduce this non exact sequence. We call it a symmetry breaking non exact sequence. So I start with some background anomalies, and I'll talk about each map in the sequence and what they mean physically. And then camera will pick up in part two. First, talk about kind of the mathematics and more specifically algebraic geometry, algebraic topology behind the non exact sequence, and then talk about how we can use the non exact sequence, for example, to say compute anomaly groups we don't really know before. And then, yeah, I want some bonus material. Okay. So bef before I get started on my sections, are there any questions about this? How does question work? How uh, people can just uh, ask, and I should remind you, online audience, also feel free to read out with uh, the speaker. Yeah, okay, feel free to interrupt me. Right, so I want to, okay, so for my part, this is the end goal, okay? So basically, we have a long exact sequence. I will introduce what I mean later, and this is a fancy graphics on the side, but my I just my entire section is just gonna be over introducing this. But before I get started, I want to first kind of give a- How about you, you can even just give some summary of the, the kind of pictures and things you were mentioning in the previous slide? Sorry, what you said? Can you kind of just sketch what you want to talk about the previous line? Oh, you will take my entire part. So we'll get to it. Yeah. Okay. Let me do some background first. Okay. So yeah. So before I get started, I want to kind of briefly review the top anomalies. So again, I believe probably everyone in the audience are familiar with them, but I kind of want to take a specific point of view. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I just keep coming. Actually, it may not be a bad idea if, if you want to sketch what you say. The previous slides, but anyway, you could. I will, I promise. Because maybe you will introduce a lot later in the but, but anyway, go I, I, I promise I will get okay. it. Okay. But let me try, try to first give some perspective on anomalies. So, so let's just, so if we have a D dimensional theory C with, you know, always a symmetry group G, then, you know, we'll say, oh, it has a top anomaly. What does it mean? Okay. So maybe the first answer to say is this anomaly beta. Is the obstruction to gauging the G symmetry? Right? This is a very familiar thing to say. Another answer one would get is that beta, maybe a little bit more refined. So beta is obstruction to gauging variably coupled Z to G gauge flows. So in some sense, people say making them local. Okay. But in this talk, here's kind of the perspective that we're taking. So beta is the obstruction for Z to be symmetrically non-degenerate gap. And what does that mean? It means to be able to symmetrically deform C. So you can think about adding some symmetry preserve, you know, some G symmetric terms into the Lagrangian to such that to deform into a theory that has a non degenerate gap on C. So it's sort of a trivial theory. Okay. So the standard, the normal way people say is that, you know, if you if, if Z has a non trivial anomaly, then it cannot have a symmetry preserving gap. That's what we will say, and that's kind of the perspective we'll be taking on. But before I move on, there are kind of two more perspectives I, I don't want to keep in mind. So this is the one we'll be focusing on, and we'll use this to basically argue for things. But two more perspectives, one is this idea of folk boundary correspondence. So I can think about, so this is more condensed matter, and in this one, I think about beta as a D plus one dimensional SBT, so symmetry protected topological phase. So that's like a D plus one dimensional theory, but you know, it has no 
you know, local excitation by itself or it's convertible. And what, what we can feel is Z, the theory that we started with, is actually not really well defined by itself, but rather it should be at the boundary of beta. So that's kind of both our response. And lastly, I want to point out that they don't do the book computation and just for the classification of anomaly SPTs, then we tend to view beta as living in some cohomology class. I'm not going to, in my part, I'm not going to be too specific about what this cohomology class is and Cameron is going to specify. But are there any questions about when you say non degenerate grounds, do you mean it doesn't have a, or non degenerate, you mean that's one dimension? Yeah, exactly. So it's like a TQFT, but it's also a convertible. Yeah. So it has a gap and it's also, it has a plus one dimension class, say of all metals. Okay. Are there any other questions about this? Okay. Great. And the next thing I kind of want to briefly reveal is, a, you know, normally when we think about nominee, it's associated to a symmetry G, but recently there has been like this new perspective about anom you know, families, anomalies that are in families of theories, which I also kind of want to do. So suppose Z now can depend on a parameter, let's call that phi of phi, I think it's phi, phi, and phi, say phi can be the strength of some magnetic field, for example. Then what we can do is we can couple Z to background phi on gauge, so background phi is just a scalar field. And then what the anomaly would be, it would be the obstruction for the partition function, we want to run a partition for that, to be consistently defined for all phi inside of, kind of this parameter manifold. Okay. And in the case that's anonymous, now what tends to happen is that the partition function that you write down is really a section of a non-trivial number. So the failure to trivialize it, it's still anomaly. So it's not really a number, but it's a section. Okay. When you say uh, anomaly of in families, you just mean the classification of anomalies. Hmm? When you say anomaly of tears in families, you just mean the classification of anomalies in terms of groups? I just want to say intuitively, I want to think about the anomaly this way. What do you mean by appearing families? It's an anomaly that assigned some characteristic class assigned to the entire family of theories. Yeah. Uh, for given anomaly? Now, if I give you a family of theories, right? Say it has a parameter, I want to assign you some, I, I want to assign this, I want, I want to think about the anomaly of the entire family as kind of what I described, so this obstruction. And we'll see some more detailed example later. So maybe if you have a question. Great. And again, this is kind of this consistently fine, or like, you know, kind of similar. And in this talk, I want to kind of, again, have a slightly different emphasis, which is that I want to think about beta as an obstruction to deform C. So remember before, when we deformed C, I deformed a single theory, but now I can have this family of theory, right? So I want to think about beta as the obstruction to deform C such that, you know, just you can think of us adding operators, you know, family of operator, such that after you deform it, you will become non degenerate gap for all values, okay? And what, but what tends to happen in this system is that you will be non degenerate gap, or we just, we just call it gap for now, it would be gap for most of the values, but there's, say, for example, there's singularity points where it fails to be. Yeah. And that's kind of where the interesting point is. Then we'll see plenty of examples for that. But this is kind of the perspective of the anomaly. And, I, and one last thing I want to say is that we can kind of combine the two previous situations. So I can have the case where I have this parameter n, but now g acts of n. So this, we we'll call this kind of, kind of echo, echo variant. And in which case, I'm restricting to deformation, which are echo variant. So they're kind of respect the g symmetry. Again, I'll gain, if you're confused by that, I'll get into specific detail what that is. And I just want to say again, to how to compute this mathematically, if I think about this as a cohomology theory, then um, then beta lives in this cohomology, taking value of this parameter domain. So that's basically all the anomaly review that we need. Are there any questions? No? Okay, great. So now I want to move on to introduce the, so I guess I'll, uh, I don't know how to use this. So now I want to move on to actually start introducing the three maps in the online cyclists. And, and don't worry, Juven, I will, you know, we'll go through the numbers.
So, but but to begin, I want to, yeah, I want to kind of first begin with a question. So, so let's say I start with the d-dimensional theory. It has a g-symmetry and it has an anomaly, or the anomaly is not zero. Okay. So, if we don't have say gravitational anomalies, then we expect that we can kind of deform z somehow and gap the system, but at the cost of breaking g. Right. Because if you break g, then the anomaly, the g anomaly, can't really say much. Right. By the way, I come to all this. Like the gravitational anomaly is caused by as a z class the the positive gravitational anomaly. Yes, this statement I think is true. Like the gravitational anomaly is it's a global gravitational anomaly. Yeah, classified by z two z m. Then okay. I think that is, you can still have a gap phase, right? When I say gap, I mean like trivial gap. So oh. you only have one ground state. You cannot have topological gap. Yeah, sorry. So maybe I should declare. So when I say gap. Yeah. And it means non-degenerate gap. Okay. You cannot have published. You cannot carry it. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Because you know, the, I think you clarify by just say that the the way you say here is like the by the theory W two W three. Mm -hmm. The boundary of B has gravitational anomaly. Mm -hmm. It's a C two class global gravitational anomaly. Mm -hmm. But the boundary can have a gap T of T. Sure. But but you don't want to have a T of T. Yeah, I don't want. Okay. I'm I'm trivially gap. But we'll be mostly working with gapless degrees of freedom. So yeah, but that's a, at least a good one. Okay, good. So here's a question. But now when we say we can gap C by breaking G, I want to be more refined about that, right? So if I have a symmetry breaking phase, that we will say, then this, this single this normally is an order parameter. So for example, the spinning, I think. Okay. So here's a slightly more refined question, which is that let rho be a k-dimensional representation can we gap the theory using a symmetry breaking parameter phi that's transforming in such representation? So I'm asking for symmetry breaking, but in a specific representation. And you see, I might get a different answer for different representation. So let me, here's a, I think this is the only definition, at least in my part, huh? So I'm gonna call a theory row gappable, so I'm gonna be more precise about it. If there are all the parameters we can distinguish operators, you can write down the theory, that transforms as rho on the G, such that when I add in these operators and I deform it large enough, so for large enough, I just use this, and for large enough CI, then I have a gap non general ground state for every point kind of on this large enough sphere, sphere of God. Okay, so basically I'm thinking about, you know, I, I, I view my theory standing kind of at the origin, but now if I kind of deform the theory, and I deform it far enough, if this C, J is not large enough, then I say this theory is row gappable if I can if I have such deformation, such that for on the large enough sphere, the gap on the Okay. So one example, a very simple example of this is I can just start with a direct fermion with G equal to U1 L symmetry. So this is a chiral symmetry, you only ask on that the part. Then this is anonymous, this is anonymous symmetry, it's not vector. And it is row gappable if I take row to be the charge one representation. And why is that? It's because I can pick my O1 and O2 to be just the direct masses. So the direct mass are charge one under the U1 L symmetry. So that's an example. So if I add this into set of the front gen, and when you think about it, for any non zero value, the fermion gets a mass and the theory becomes gap. So that's an example of row gap. Anyway, just make sure. So, uh, but here in the definition, it seems you are emphasizing the larger nerve CJ's yes. radius. But for the example below, for the Dirac fermion, it seems like we can just get it by the small mass. As yes. Well. Yeah. So you are emphasizing the large radius because. It's good enough to assume in the large radius. On another situation, like masses, it's good. In, yeah. It turns out if you just deform it one slightly, you will be. But, but large radius is good enough. And we're going to start. Right. So the reason I asked, I think it's a very good point. but. Uh, because the one fermion term is a uh, relevant deformation. Yes, so you exactly. So if you have non, if you have non perturbative deformation, you might have to deform a little bit even more for it to be dropped. Yeah. Exactly. So you will consider deformation beyond relevant deformation. Absolutely. You yeah. can consider even more than marginal deformation. Yeah. But I can consider rather than one that can so non perturbative gap. Okay, I mean, non perturbative beyond the RG analysis. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I mean, it, ter it turns out what we will do are motivating it, but it will be a anomaly analysis, which will be non predictable. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it doesn't matter if it's uh, more it's predictably. Yeah. So that's the point. Thanks. Okay. okay. So so let's try to understand this notion of row gap gapable a little bit. So in the case that rows the trivial representation, right? That might 
or lambda r prime have to add in is symmetric preserved, right? So therefore, z is row gappable if it is symmetrically gappable. What we said before. Now again, when you view symmetrically gappable, is equivalent to saying that the anomaly is zero, right? Symmetric gappable the anomaly. Good. So now this kind of inspires now if. If rho is a trivial representation, we understand what it's just asking, just asking for a nominee to be zero, then it's here a nominee interpretation for a general representation rho, right? For a specific uh, symmetry breaking path. Okay. And the answer is yes. And the way here's how we can think about it. So currently Z is just a theory kind of by itself. What we can think about is we can just kind of spread it out trivially over the over this sphere, right? So this is a sphere of this k-dimensional like space, right? And now, to roll out the theory really just means that I want to, well, while well, I could, like, G equivalently, gap this in fact, entire family of theory over this way. That's kind of what I'm doing. So every single point, I'm kind of deforming away, kind of preserve the G symmetry, but I would kind of gap every single, the theory over every single point. I have a question. Yes. So relatively to the first bullet point and also the definition earlier, is the other parameter that may have a space time dependent? O of x, so you have an O of x, so that has space time dependent. I will, it will be in later, but right now I'm just thinking about the abstract parameter space. Yeah. Later, I'm going to kind of couple, kind of make that order parameter change across space time, but now right. Yeah. right now, I'm kind of thinking about this this theory as you know, for this, these things are fixed. I'm not kind of like very CJ across space. So, one point is that because you say the O of x is in some representation yes. of rho. Yeah. But now in this bullet point, you say it's in the trivial representation in order to be anomaly free. Yes. So in some case, maybe for complex matter people, not quite rigorous, but they say that if you have some of the parameter, maybe still in non trivial representation. Yeah. And then if you are able to argue with gap everywhere, then you may try to disorder this other parameter. Yes. And yeah, you absolutely. I'm not, I, not I'm not going to consider anything related to that. I know what you're talking about. I'm not going to try yeah. to try to disorder and get as much. That's okay. not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to gap this over the screen. Okay. Yeah. So okay. where is this family? So, so so C is kind of a family over a single point, like G so kind of yeah, but how do you spread it over I just kind of what is I can when if I think about family as pull back, just pull back from the vector space map. On this sphere map to a single point. Yeah. So it's kind of trivial, right? So it's kind of constant every single over every single point when I start with, right? But then I want to kind of deform it every point. I kind of pick some um, operator adding to the function or the Hamiltonian and then deform it long enough and shut the gap down. So, so you can think about it is, I mean, you can think about it as I start with H0, kind of so many points. And at every point of the sphere, I pick that direction and right? adding these operators. Right? And that's deforming in an equivalent. And if for large enough CJ, I get a unique ground state, then this is what I mean right? by equivalent. It's gap. Rogue gap is a gap is a gap of Sorry, what'd you say? Gapable in this sense, can I just restrict it to a point in the sphere and then find that it's gapable? Well, but G can move the sphere. Oh, so, so if G is if it's sorry, so before I'm kind of assuming rows a G representation, everything after I'm going back to a general representation. You're, you're saying that gapable. Saying it's equivalent to saying the anomaly of the theory vanishes. Yes. Yeah. Now you have some other question, pro gap of it, where you're trying to say the anomaly of some family of the theory Yes. Yeah. I'm trying to get what the family of is. Surely it's not just a trivial family, but spread it over some parameters. Yeah. No? Yes. Yeah. So, so the way to do it is there's a map. So, anomaly is a ritual anomaly map, right? It kind of, well, in some sense, you, you in a real case would be just more interesting in this in the simple case, then it kind of just this constant family. Rather this family and people over a point, they just kind of trivially go back to S1. And that's and the obstruction is there, which is just that that element here is zero or not. 
So that family just constantly came back to the city. You're saying that meant to zero the original one possible? Yeah. So, so for example, the three plus one decays. It's not. It, it becomes zero. It's real guy. Becomes zero. No. We'll, 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 we'll get to it. Yeah. But I'm just saying. Here's an example of a real gap of a theory for being a matching. Oh, sorry. What becomes zero? No, normally it becomes zero. Oh, I'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. But 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 I just make sure. But how do you know if you just choose some representation? And you say that this deformation might be even irrelevant deformation. How do you know whether in your definition that theory can be gappable? How do you test it? Sometimes it cannot be sub, like a Dirac formula, you can just sub by subbing the spectrum because it's quadratic terms. Yes. But in general, we'll see, we'll see. We'll, we'll have an algorithm okay. similar to that. We can talk about it out. Okay, good. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> yep. So great. So so what well, normally what's happening is that this a Kind of this kind of pullback map or anomaly, we call it the residual anomaly map. And what happens is that remember that our original theory has an anomaly that lives in here. So when I apply beta, I get this anomaly of this kind of uniform family. And this is precisely the obstruction to gap C over this. So another way to say that is C is real gappable if this residual anomaly, the residual anomaly. So again, this is kind of like the symmetry preserving case. So if rho is trivial, then you can just imagine this might be set empty. And if rho is non-trivial, then I kind of have to have to apply this residual anomaly map. So, so what I'm trying to say, if I want to check if my theory is rho capable, I mean, this might not be the only thing, but the first thing I would do is check on anomaly. And then what I do is I map down to this anomaly group, table this the family. And then if it's rho capable, definitely um, the residual anomaly applies to beta. So, so, sorry. So, what's this? Uh, you're saying these are uh, some differential cohomology of the omega? No, no, no. I'm thinking about like, some classification of SPD. Okay. You can think about Google and Facebook. But uh, you say this, oh, the S of rho, can you clarify that meaning? Just this thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so mathematically, I think about this like cohomology theory, it makes sense to take value in any space. So, and I think about this as a family. So, it's classifying SPT. Like a like entire family of SP, SPs. But by S of rho is a sphere in where just uh, S of rho is a K is it looks like SK minus one. So it's like K minus one dimension sphere. What case of dimension? Yeah. And but it's a little bit subtle because she kind of acts in the sphere. So you have to kind of, this sounds fancy technology, but it's basically just take it So if the left hand side is the classifying the D plus one dimension or SPT the street symmetry, yes. On the side, what what do you try to classify on the right hand side? Maybe there's something. Yeah, so D plus one dimension SPT of families of SPT over you know over over S pro. And what does it mean to classify over the sphere? What does it mean to classify yeah. over the sphere? It means you have a family of SPT, right? So SPT. So, so a family SPT is a, well, basically, well, it's a family. It's something that if I give you a, a point on the sphere, you give me back an SPT and it varies smoothly. There's no. Yeah. Now, what would be the space on the left hand side if you put it on a point? Over? Yeah. So, so, so if you give me something there, I kind of just take the uniform family. So, over every point, it would be the same. So, that would be a point. Yeah. If yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. Point. This would be up a point. Exactly. And this is also a pullback. My family just also a pullback procedure. Okay. Are there any other questions? But, but why do you choose sphere? Why do I choose sphere? Yeah. We'll see. 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 We'll Analogous to, I mean, supposing you take the universe of first term, supposing you pull it back to the total space of the circle, of the universe, that class trivializes. So, 
the anomaly on the previous page, but it's actually it's the previous anomaly. It's getting easier. They get more trivial. You can have more parameters, like I'm before. I will keep going. So I think I think we're in well need of doing an actual example. You know, in some sense, a pretty concrete question. So, so let me so, so before I give you an example where the theory is real capable, let me give you one where we can show it's not real capable. Okay. So consider two plus one D majorana fermion, and it's well known it has a time reversal symmetry. And so take so so here's here's one way you can do this. So this is a Z2 symmetry. Okay, it scores to I think it's supposed to be minus one to the half, yes. Okay, so row zero, so I, so this is a Z2 group. Let's take row zero to be the sound representation. Then this is actually row gappable because I have this TR mass term. I can just write down. So the marginal on the mass is TR. And that gaps here, right? With, so on one side is negative mass, and the other side is negative mass. But now let's do something a little bit more non-trivial. Now I can ask, what about if I take rho to be the direct sun r to one? Is this rho gappable? So putting in more plain words, can I find two T odd operators, O1 and O2, such that, so let's say this is the Hamiltonian for the just the two plus one dimension of masses fermion, such that when adding these two operators, right? Then then if R is big enough, so kind of far enough away, I ask, can this be gap for all theta? So for the entire circle of large enough units. So that's kind of that's what it means to ask the question if it's okay. And we want to now I want to give you an argument that the answer is no. And in fact, so we're saying that there's no operators for one. So how, how can we prove something like this? Well let's do a kind of a trivial example. So let's just take both or a really lazy one. So let's take both O1 and O2, which is speed of much around It's a little different than I mean time reversal is not an external symmetry. It's no. Just couple. Here you have n plus one. Yes. What are you going to take? Sphere? Of what sphere are you putting that? So the pin plus, pin plus still have a Z2 pop. So it has it's a map from pin plus to O1. Right, just mapping the components to the part. And that, so that's a one dimensional representation, right? So you can pull back there and you can take the sphere bundle of that one dimensional. So, so, so what row really is, is a, is a one dimensional representation of pink plus. So, so you're restricting the spin. You're restricting the spin. Yes. 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 Is the gravitation thing? Well, it won't like that. Right. Um, I mean, so oh, for for roll for roll not you will vanish. But for this one, it's a little bit. Different. The groups won't look like the words in the group of some sphere. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely yes. In the case of things like pink plus, things are twisted. So, um. I guess I will turn this one down. Just make sure. So, raise this in terms of the language in the previous slide. So you have an omega four pin plus yeah z sixteen map to some. I will get to that. I'll compute that. Okay. Right now. You were saying you want to do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I will get to it. <laughs> okay. Any other question? But yes, I'll, I mean I'll get to that. Okay. I'll compute it precisely. So let's do a trivial example. And as we'll see, this example is already good enough, okay? which is kind of a, kind of perhaps surprising. So let's take the example where O1 and O2 are both the much on the mass set. Well, we know that for kind of just O1 itself works, O2 itself works, maybe the pure also works. Well, obviously it doesn't, right? Because at theta equal to plus or minus three pi over four, the, the term that you write down, you see just cancel each other out, right? You have an effective, the mass is just zero. Okay. And moreover, what happens is that at this region, so I guess I'll use this. At this region, the mass would be negative, right? And at this region, the mass would be positive, both of which the scenario would be gap. So, so. Sorry, actually, what's this theta? 
for what S1 circle in the state of for oh uh, yeah it's yeah it's it's parameterized in the angle it's parameterized the circle yeah yeah it's parameterized in the angle and how's that right to the sphere you say earlier well this this is the sphere right but just S1 S1 sphere yeah S1 yeah it's S1 it's two dimension so it's sphere it's S1 mm -hmm. yeah. So what happens is that when I go from, so, so th here the mass is negative, here the mass is positive. Going from negative positive max, as you know, locally, that's what happens. What happens is that you pump uh, P plus I patient. And on the, on the, you know, at the opposite side, so at the time reversal side, go from positive mass to negative mass. Mass, you pump some P minus I. So that's kind of what happens when I grow on the sphere. They're kind of just two bad points. Here's a claim on the map, which is that the number, so, so let's say if I start right here, scap here, then here's kind of the, the antiquator point. Here's a claim on the make, which is that the number of P plus, or well, minus really, it doesn't matter mark two, so number of P plus IP pump across half an arc, so just count this, is actually a topological pair. And well, more specifically, it's invariant under any definition, you know, in a sense. So I'm just going to, so to argue for this, I'm just going to kind of do it on my own. Okay, so this is our anomaly part of the Okay, let's, so as I said before, let's just check this map on anomaly. So I'm going to run a Fermi's anomaly, just one in omega four P plus, which is this thing, right? It's a generator for the C16 class. Actually, sorry. Although you are just going to explain, but I want to make sure the physical picture you have on your slide. So I guess you are thinking about some time reversal breaking domain wall, right? Um, that, exactly. So these are time reversal breaking. And then T, T is breaking oppositely on two sides, right? Yeah. And and there, there usually you are consider the surface state of the 3D surface state of the 4D pin plus yes. theory. Yes. And then you have the time reversal breaking domain wall probably goes like this. Yes. Now I exercise the chiral Marana biothermal in one plus one B. Yeah. Which is on the in, the domain wall yeah. interface between these two two plus one breaking domain yeah, exactly. going opposite the right so that's the picture yes but uh, how do I think about the S one circle in this physical setting which we know on the surface how is that circle mean in this physical picture if right so so I mean if you go all the way around then you will experience a p plus i p one pump and then you go to a p minus i p that, that's fine, but I'm, I'm just thinking about if I just consider some surface state of this, you know, this thing called topological superconductor. Yeah. And, the, and then you see this, these are like a two plus one D surface, and it's this T breaking yeah. theory. And you're considering those two modes. That's what you're drawing. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about how, how are you thinking about going back? Like, what's this sphere? Anyway, so maybe this sphere just, uh, this sphere just some. Pass on the on the two plus one D boundary. So I mean, what's this S one circle? It's an S one circle of um two plus one D theories. Okay, right. Most of them yeah. are gap. So most of these theories say over here, yeah, over here, here gap, think, and at the gap this point, I can think about this as a time reversal domain wall. Yeah, on the domain wall is a much around the wall. Yeah. So that's I think that's how I can put yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I can get you a picture. Just consider the T-breaking domain will connect the two sides. Yeah, so that's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happens at yes. this point. At this point. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Well, the picture I gave is a familiar kind of setting compensated many people will think, but you are just connecting a domain on two sides. Yeah. And they have the same bar, and then you get it as one. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So maybe maybe related to that. So if I go all the way around the circle, the total number of um, these people that be pump has to be zero, right? Because they kind of come in time reversal pairs. But now I want to claim that if I just count the number mod two of half the circle is actually invariant. So no matter kind of whether whatever I want to do with O1 and O2, it doesn't matter, I would kind of get the same result. You will always be up. So one mod two. Okay, and the reason for that is kind of simple because it's just an argument in a nominee. So so as we said, the much of the formula previously kind of lives in this. One plus sixteen is the generator of a Z sixteen class, and then on the other ten, if you just compute what this is, you exactly get a Z two class, and what it does is it counts the it, 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 exactly what I said before. It's a, the description is it counts the 
number of people studying from across Hong Kong. Huh? <clears throat> I mean, the same way when you just had one copy, it wasn't a mega book in plus a decimal, it's a mega force book. Yes. So is it this one? Sorry, yeah. So it is. So what what happens here is that you have this Z two, right? And the Z two is trying to act on S one, and this is the quotient S one. So so yeah. So this is a twisted class, but you can untwist it, right? Because S one must be two. So Z two. And and I mean, I, I you know I wasn't planning to kind of to go into the with the computation. And what this is, it really is. So what the, what's the S one there? The S one there. You know, pull back to just half an R, right? It's an R and you pull together. And what this S1 is kind of kind of, kind of domain one now. And the domain one normally is exactly the how many people send it from. And that's why the Z2, so the Z2 is coming just from I think omega three of spin. Omega two of spin? Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's like it's coming from the pi one. It's it's the Z it's the first, it's a Z Z2, Z2 is the first. Z2. And our example, we just did a very simple example, but what it tells us is that, you know, if I have a module on a fermion there, then you will map to one, that's it, right? Because I have odd number of people that you have. So just a, just a simple calculation, kind of the typical example I did before, already tells me that the residual value is the I think a common thing is the question about this omega three spin zero, I think this are the both is in group, but yes. you are considered a TP, of what you face version of the code is yes, that's I am. you are shifting from the omega I am also yes. Z from the omega C. Yes. Uh, T T P is really yes. I'm there, I'm thinking about IC. Yeah. So when I say omega, I mean the IC. Yeah. Okay. Great. So 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 the residual normally is not zero. What kind of consequences can we say? Well, the first one is that, well, as we just said before, for any choices of R01 and O2, the number of people that be pumped across half of R, so just Going from yeah, going to the end of point has to be up, cannot be zero. That's what this is measuring. Right? And in particular, that means that no matter relevant, marginal, you know, irrelevant, whatever operator you want to choose, there's no way to kind of, you know, basically, there's no way we can go through half the art and not find a gap that's small that forms the people inside. So the two plus one D marginal formula is not working. For any rule or just for this? For this rule. For this kind of yeah. yeah. And okay, about again, I want to point out that in some sense, it's basically all we need to do to check that is kind of pick the simplest choice, right? There's plenty of other O1 and O2 time odd operators I can try to add in. We pick the simplest one, and it turns out that that's already sufficient to argue for any other definition. Which, in some sense, right, that's kind of a surprising argument, right? Because there's infinitely many key odd operators you can choose. Okay, are there any questions about this? So is there some appropriate role make it uh, capable to remind you? Yeah, so, so I just gave you one before, right? This one. Uh, uh, if yeah. I just pick the one dimension of sound right, right, then the much on the master. But, but I'm asking for kind of a harder question, which is kind of fun, two TR operators, yeah. gap it, and then Any other question? So just to recap what we got so far, so there's nothing much on the board right now, but basically all we have is just a single map, the residual anomaly map, and the image here kind of tells you the theory is row gap. That's kind of how So one question is that here, the choosing a particular row of some symmetry, Yeah. here it seems like you are doing the symmetry breaking. Yes. Like the gap, the yeah, theory, absolutely, absolutely. And then kill the anomaly. But yeah, is, there, sure. is there some use for this for not, not breaking the symmetry, but still having symmetric gap, TQFT type of uh, construction? No, I'm not thinking about that. I'm yeah. thinking about non-degenerate gap, the theory, even if it breaks the symmetry. Okay. But I'm not thinking about any TQFT. No problem. Thank yeah. you. And again, most of the, all the degrees of fitting here are going to be gaps. So, so moving forward, we only have one map. I promise you three. 
<clears throat> to actually get to the other one. So now let's assume that Z is row gappable again for anomaly, which is all we really need to say just that the residual anomaly becomes zero. Well, can the anomaly tell us anything more? Well, this is zero. Maybe this is only thing it tell us. But in fact, it can tell us. More. And this answer is already answered by this previous paper um, in the case where G is. And I want to kind of re revisit what they argue. So giving a row gapping, so let's write down the order parameter SV, right? And now, as kind of you were saying, but now I can do this construction where I kind of fix this, what the order, the value of the order parameter, and then it vary across space, right? So again, you can think about it's like tuning, and I can be filled in different parts in different areas. In particular, I want V to be take this form. So let V I to just be some basis. And one and I take some I want to take some space coordinate x1 to xk, just match up with vi and kind of divide by them. So I want v to be of this specific form when the radius is large. Huh? And what that does is that if this the sphere kind of if I would kind of want around this, you know, the coordinates x1 to xk once, that sphere, you will you will kind of v kind of wrap around the sphere in the So this is the one you can. And what that would do is you will create a defect that's localized <coughs> at x1 equal to xk equal to zero. That's where the, that's when v takes the value zero. Okay. And because those, because this, now if I think about the system, the entire system is gap, only gapless, the gapless, even TQRT, the only expectation are local, have to be localized. Right. There's nothing interesting outside of that defect. So therefore, kind of this defect system can view as a D minus K emission system. Kind of just standing by this. And just maybe this is a little bit more familiar. So in the case where V is one dimensional, the system I will create their code dimension one, the world people don't go domain one. So it's the domain one guys. In case two, they're the vertices, right? So like X means like axial strings. And then K to the three people call these hedgehogs and small. Great. So more, so so moreover, let's try to, so again, so I'm thinking about the system living on the defect as a kind of a theory kind of standing by itself. So because right, so again the defect lies where the order parameter value becomes zero. That's when it becomes capitalist. And this, no, this is a, so even though um, G acts on V of rho, it kind of, it fixes the origin zero, right? So there's a sense that the defect theory, again, <laughs> only interesting happen when V equals zero, it has a residual G symmetry, okay? But one of the things that the author found in the paper is that that G symmetry is actually twisted. So there's a twisting going on there. And uh, I, I don't want to say too much about them, but, Basically, you kind of this twisting is very much related to things like sharing, and it it like mathematically it relates like it, this twisting is actually what takes things like a uh, unitary C two symmetry and make it P plus P minus, and you exchange things like spin cross U one and spins. So so or so now I'm going to build this defect theory. It has a G symmetry and it has an anomaly, right? An anomaly class is D plus one minus K now, just because it's a D minus K dimension. Right. So what they find in the paper is that there is a defect anomaly map. So in fact, the anomaly on the defect map into the book. Remember, this is what we started out with. It's a defect anomaly map. And also the author wrote on this anomaly matching condition, which is that the defect anomaly so, so, so the defect anomaly under the defect anomaly map has to recover. So in particular, if let's say the bulk starting with beta is non-zero, that implies that alpha has to be non-zero, right? So the defect has to have anomaly, and that implies that it has to have interesting expectation. So if you have an anonymous system, even if you can row gap it, there's still interesting expectation living on the defect, right? It cannot be truly true. So one, so one example, I mean, we just saw some, right? So if I have, say, the icing model is anomaly-free, right? The domain where they are carrying no expectations. 
But if I think about the Majorana fermion, then it's anonymous. I can break the time reversal symmetry, but the domain law has to carry an execution. That's the P plus IP. So, so are there any questions about this? Might have missed it on the one plus Q row. So like the Q row, yeah. So it's it's kind of hard to describe. It's it's quite subtle. But one example of what it looks like is if you just take Z to be Z2, Q to be Z2 in a fermionic system, then this Q row might be some like plus. So all of a sudden it might be anti-unitary and it might switch to some PL. Another example is let's say my original G just U1, just a nice U1, then this G row might be spin C. So if I go all the way to two pi, I might I might get myself back into it. So it's so it's really twisting with fixed time symmetry, and the, I can say a little bit about the reason. The reason is because basically, to the defect theory, G doesn't still doesn't really act on it because because like G is going to move these points around. Okay, so to really actually fix it, what you have to do is also have to rotate the system. So you're going to have to accompany by space time symmetry, and that's where you start speaking. So for example, if now so for some representation, you kind of have to flip things. You have to fix that by applying CEP with it, which takes unitary symmetry to entire. And this is like all of these are what we'll explain in this case. And maybe, yeah, I mean, one, one last thing maybe I want to add is that this is exactly also the kind of twist that appears in crystal. It's the same exact twist. But I don't want to remark too much on that. It's, it's, it's a good question. Yeah. So for the, did you have introduced two maps so far. One is the anomaly resolution. Yes. The other is the defect anomaly maps. Yes. And what other this this are the homomorphism map, but but is, is there some relation of the injective, subjective, or any type of the constraint like this? That's a great question. So in fact, the author, oh, I'm going to answer it, but I want to kind of repeat it. There's also the kind of question that so the authors in this paper they find this map and they ask the exact same question. Is this injective? Is this subjective? And the answer is neither. It can be whatever, in fact. And but what it does form is the form of non exact sequence. And I will tell you what that means. So it's a non exact sequence is kind of a weird mixture of objectivity and subjective. And same for the anomaly resolution map. Or it will be exact everywhere. I will tell you what that means. It, it, can, be, it can be neither. Neither injective. Yeah, oh, sorry, exactly. In general, it can be neither injective. So that sometimes it just might everything to zero. Right. But I, but what happens is that when you combine all of the maps together, they become incredibly constrained. And cameras for the time. But in the interest of so I was gonna do the example of a three plus one D Dirac from you, but in the, I think in the interest of time, especially to Cameron, I'm going to skip this. Yeah, it's okay, we'll take your time. Oh it's it's okay. I I I, I think yeah. But but to summarize, to recap, here's what we got so far. Well if this we still, yeah, we have this residual anomaly map, and then we have a map, kind of a predecessor. And moreover, this is kind of what you were saying. This, I clear this sequence of maps is actually exact at here. And what does that really mean? It means that if I start with this anomaly beta and it maps to zero, then I, I can then being exact means that I can find an alpha that maps to it. In fact, it's the equal on the and physically, how do I do that, right? So if I start with the theory, when I map to zero, the residual anomaly zero is row gappable. If it's row gappable, right, I find such a row gapping, and then I create this top loss right? And the defect, so I have a defect here, and then the anomaly matching process has to match them. And that's, so, so physically, that's what, um, yeah. So, so how do we create this printout? You see anomaly of the defect system? Again, and row gapping is only possible, if the precision problems. Okay, so so again, like maybe to mathematician, this is pretty standard kind of argument, but I'm trying to using a physical Are there any questions? So to move on, so now I just want to get basically viewing this last step. Okay, along exact sequence, take three different maps. Excuse me. Oh, I do have.
Okay, but now I want to kind of revisit the question that Juven was saying. So, so remember, so is, if you take a look at this, maybe something that's surprising, or something surprising, what I remember when Ryan told me about it, which is that if you want to understand the relation between anomaly of the bulk versus the defect, you might imagine that the bulk anomaly determines the defect. Right? Well, because I start with the bulk here. But the answer is actually reversed, right? This map maps this way, tells us the defect anomaly. Mr. Bulk. However, this is what Juman was asking. This map does not, for example, have to be in check. There's no reason for it. And there are many examples of this number. Okay. What does that mean? It means that there's plenty of ambiguity in the defect anomaly. Okay. In particular, even if I start with a theory C that has zero anomaly, in fact, I can just start with the most boring theory, just a, just a trivial space, trivial theory, it can still, if I, if I just kind of wind things around, I can still have anonymous defects. I can I can still create defects with that. So yeah, so here's a question. So what is ambiguity in the defect anomaly? So I don't know what to put this, so what are all these defect anomaly that maps to zero? So one way you can think about it is that remember where the where the defect come from? The defect come from this row gap. Okay, and let's revisit what row graphing is. It assigns a non-degenerate ground state to every point on the sphere as well. Right, so it's, a, so it's kind of this invertible family, right? But this invertible family typically is not free of G anomaly, in fact, but in fact, but this is precisely G anomaly. So therefore, in the case of beta equal to zero, that's the case we're caring about, the row gapping, what it really defines is, is an invertible family over the sphere of d-dimensional system, and it doesn't have anomaly. So therefore, what it really is, is just a d-dimensional And, you know, d-dimensional is really class. So before this entire time, we will, be, we will have been using this anomaly perspective, right? kind of this both d plus dimensional. Now we're kind of using this SPT um, approach to anomalies. And I think about this is a big But this is this still might again we'll have concrete examples, but this still might, you know, this feel kind of vague. If I think about this anomaly, can I find a D minus one dimensional theory with this anomaly? Or right? can I find the boundary theory to this SPT that I just found? So something maybe more dynamic. And the answer is yes. Yeah. So so we can find that amigo theory, the anomaly. Here's how you do it. So the so remember, here's kind of how our, our row gapping. But now in the case of C or H0 is anomaly free, why don't we just assume that? I just kind of symmetrically form the theory such that H0 already have a symmetric underneath. So if I think about this as a family of theory with you know over this parameter space, let's why don't we assume the origin is already you know non-degenerate. But furthermore, what do we know is that this is a remember this is a row gapping. It means that this is also a gap for large enough part, right? So if I actually look at the phase diagram, this is kind of what it looks like. So the, this is so let's say I have C one and C two. Then at the origin, and in the neighborhood of the origin, this theory is just going to be non-degenerate gap, right? Because being getting gap is a you know. So, uh, generic. Okay. But we're also assuming outside of a large enough sphere, <coughs> this theory is also a gap. That's our role gap. Right? In fact, it defines this uh, d dimension as. Okay. So if gamma, if this thing outside, so for large enough radius, it describes a non trivial SPT, then I don't, then starting from kind of a trivial one around here, we have a non trivial one, we expect there are some points as on radius r such that this system felt to be um, gap, right? Or else if I can just non determine gap entire system, you would trivialize. Okay. Okay. So basically, if you look at the phase diagram, you expect something like this. Okay. Again, we'll do a complete example. Okay. So, so now what we can say is, well, again, the theory inside, so what this boundary theory is that this radius R is, well, it's a, SR family theory, 
but I can think about the interface between this SPT and the trivial phase. Alternatively, I can just think about it as a D minus one dimensional theory with this family alone. It's D minus one dimensional because to set this up, I have, I have to use basically one dimensional space. So now I have this technical theory, how to recover to the defect and the defect is just built by kind of shrinking. And now again, as before, maybe this physical to be more mathematical, we can just consider what happens to this more anomalies. And it turns out this to be a generalization of what people call the catalyst effects here. Okay. And in the original work, what they were trying to consider is counting from me on like zero modes. At the core from us. And in general, what it will become is an index map of this. And when it does, it kind of just like shrink this d minus one dimension theory into a single point. Well, two dimension. Okay. And moreover, we hypothesized that there's also this anomaly matching. So this our original gamma parameter is here, where I, the index of this better match the anomaly. So again, so, so again, that was really abstract. So I want to do a complete example. So let's consider, so this is in one of the most famous example of how topology comes into the condensed matter system. Let's consider the photo process. So I start with the one plus one derived fermion with the anomaly free. So this is the one factor symmetry, which is anomaly free. In particular, why is it not, how do I know that? Well, I can just scap it by adding any of these derived factors. Right, this is symmetry preserving them because I took the factor. Right? Well, this entire family, so, so for every single fee, it kind of just is a trivially gap system, but this entire family over S1 actually defines a non trivial SVT. Right? And I basically I wrote down the, so, so A here is, uh, um, yeah, it's just a one form for the U1 symmetry, and this is kind of the, yeah, third is. So now I want to, how do I kind of recover that? One, you know, boundary theory, here's how I do it. So currently, this system, if I just add this in the Hamiltonian, you will be gap at zero. So why don't I actually just first add in a mask? So it's zero scale. Now, I also add in this family of direct mass terms. It just looks kind of very simple, it looks like the following. So when is the system not gap? Well, this term better be zero. This term also better be zero, for it to have zero mass, right? And that fails at x equal to minus one, y equal to zero. So basically, we can view what happens to the system is that at the origin is gap, at very far away is gap, and it turns out in this system just a single point where it becomes gapless. Right? Again, you have to be like, there has to be a, a gapless point somewhere because this gamma is a non trivial aspect. You cannot just smoothly go from a trivial one entirely to a non trivial one if you want a non trivial aspect. Gamma is so theory of that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a non-trivial family. So for example, this is a, this is a, this is a invertible phase over S1. For example, non-trivial in the sense that I cannot fill in with an invertible phase over um E2. So it's, a, so it's a family that I cannot feel to in order. It has to go through some. You have to be gap close to something. So so sorry, what is sorry. Hmm? yeah? Maybe it's but uh, you said this defines a non trivial SPT and gamma is A P by Yeah. So sorry, what's this A? A is the A is the one for for you one. And P by is the Angle. Yeah, it's the angle. Well, this is this is what you will write down, right? You type in for the process. That's kind of like WZW. It's a topological term. And this is a gap SPT. Yeah, it's it's gap. this is gap everywhere. Right? But I cannot extend it over the origin. Each individual point is a trivial. Yeah. 
those are spin periods with the one. Yeah. Spins, I think both spins, I don't think spin C works. I think spin, I think spin crossing walls works. It, it is right because <clears throat> this because this thing has charge one or charge a half. So we just make sure. So you are defining the non-trivial as PT gamma on where? Just make sure the circle. Yeah, so you can think about this. Sorry. Uh, here. Yeah, kind of like any circle outside. And then inside is kind of this triple phase. And then transcending from the triple one to the outside one, this uh, the gap closes at a specific point. I read this one. And this has been is comfortable by Z cost. Is Z cost. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll get to that immediately, but yes, it's very similar to charge from the exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So so what happens? So what happens is I think about the S1 parameter theory at the boundary of gamma. That's this theory. This this theory I think was the founder of gamma. And what happened when I go why go why enigmatically vary as one phi why go to the angle I pump upon this charge. That's the charge, right? And that's what I was. Okay. But moreover, but now I can shrink that circle into a single point. And what I'm detecting is I'm, I'm detecting the road defects and just create a vortex. And what's the thing about the vortex is that it carries a unit charge, right? It carries a unit charge on the what is charge on the field. And and that exactly matches. And all normally this one looks like. So on the left hand side, the first group, it exactly counts the charges pumped. When I vary my U1, right? That's a U1 family, boundary theory family. When I vary it, gap closes on where I count how many charges. And on the latter, it just computes the U1 charge of that. And you see this matches, right? Because it matches one. So that's the that's what the index matching kind of looks like. And put it all together, basically what we have, so 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 sorry, so we just scrub this up. Okay, so we already introduced this too, just scrub the last one. So remember we had an argument, this is exact here, this this composite is exact here. Now I claim this composite is also exact. Okay. It's by it's by very very similar. Okay. But moreover, you know. As far as D, and any D plus one, I can kind of just, well, show you how to do this. Okay. I guess I can take this map, I just shift dimension by one, I can put it over here. Right? Again, for mathematicians, this is extreme for me. So this is the sign of our okay. And with a little bit more argument, you can show that it's also exact. This sequence of maps is like here. And what does that mean is that I can extend this map infinitely. Right, while shifting dimension with return, and moreover, it's exact at every single point. And what I give is, is precisely what we call about this next sequence. Okay, and I, that's the, that's just kind of that. So here, this one is stashed because I have to shift the dimension. Right, it's like a spectral chart. And yeah, so, so what I've done is kind of using this notion of gapping and row gapping to, and creating defects and index to try to motivate. In this nonsense. Are there any questions? Okay. So if not, then I think Cameron is going to take what I left out and talk about the more mathematics aspects. Like, for example, how this is defined. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Are you going to say one more thing? Yeah. And also, I just want to remark S stands for statistics. Again, do this for bosonic theories and fermionic theories. And in fact, there's a lot of more as you do. Right. Great. So now we're going to come to part two, where I'll say a bit more about the math and a couple of applications. So, the first thing I want to sketch is how to mathematically 
derive this long exact sequence? How do we know it forms a long exact sequence? Um, and I'll, I'll sketch that. And then I want to talk about a couple of applications of the fact that we have a long exact sequence. So Leon already gave a bunch of great examples. I'm going to revisit the defect anomaly matching map and address the question you brought up, Jupin, about how do I know if it's injective surjective? How do I use long exact sequence to see what the map actually is? And then use that to deduce something about the, the system I'm studying. And the last point, uh, the last application, well, another application I will talk about is toward computing anomaly groups. So a lot of the groups that we discuss in this paper have sort of not been computed, but we provide, well, we're going to advocate for this long exact sequence as being a way to um, another tool for computing these groups and dually computing vortism groups, which I will touch on. Okay, so let's start off with some mathematical underpinnings. I will sketch a few things. Okay, so what I want to sketch is that this long exact sequence is induced by a map of spectra. Hopefully it's not too small to see. So it's right hand side, but Leon just finished explaining to us. I want to, what I want to do is talk a little bit about this left hand side, which um, is formed out of a cofiber sequence of spectra. I want to say what that means. I take some kind of cohomology and I get a long exact sequence. So in some sense, um, a fiber sequence of spectra is like a short exact sequence of spectra that's analogous to that. And you might be, you know, in, in the world of ordinary cohomology, you know, if you have a short exact sequence of chain complexes and you take cohomology, you'll get a long exact sequence. The story here is sort of analogous, but I'll say a bit more about that later. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to specialize to fermions here. So F for fermion, and I'm going to look at systems with spin symmetry, which I'll talk about. So yeah, so the, the overall idea is that we construct a fiber sequence of spectra, we take um, cohomology in the appropriate sense, and we get this symmetry breaking long exact sequence. So let's introduce a running example that Leon already talked about a bit. So let's start with um, theories with pin plus symmetry. This corresponds to fermions with an internal time reversal symmetry that squares to fermion parity. So that will be appearing here. Let's take our symmetry breaking order parameter to be the sign representation, which we also so, saw earlier. So the sign representation is of Z2. And then the other kinds of systems that we'll be mapping to are um, systems with spin cross Z2 symmetry. So these will describe systems with fermions with an internal Z2 symmetry that's unitary and that squares to one. Okay. So I filled this in on the left hand side, and you see the sphere of rho, or sphere of sigma in this case, is coming up, coming up again. So that'll be our example. But before I get to the specific example, let me step back for a moment and say something about tangential structures. So the first definition I have up here um, might be a bit abstract, but um, I want to define a stable tangential structure to be a map C from some space B to BO. And uh, maps from B to BO in some sense are vector bundles. And so I wanna say that a manifold X has a C structure. It's the classifying map for its tangent bundle. So that's gonna be a map from X to BO. And that has a lift to this auxiliary space B. So I don't want to focus on examples here. So if I take B to be BSO, so the classifying space of the special orthogonal group, that will mean I'm studying bosonic theories. And it will correspond to my manifold X being oriented in the, in the usual sense. If I look at um, this space B being B spin smash BG, or I guess I should say cross, that's a typo. So this should describe fermionic symmetries or fermionic theories with some G symmetry. Maybe it's internal G symmetry for what we're saying today. So this is a bit vague, but we've already seen um, this B, screen, B spin cross BZ2, that's this fermionic with internal unitary symmetry, and B pin plus, which is fermionic with internal time reversal symmetry. So let me throw up a couple more examples that we saw already. So if we took B spin cross BU1, this describes fermionic systems with an internal U1 symmetry. 
And we can also twist this um, to get E spin C, which would be fermionic theories with this fractional charge. Um, but I think maybe we didn't get to that example, um, but we'll see that. So um, I guess it's like an integer plus one half charge for a B spin for a spin C fermion. So that's right. Is that because you're having a different covering of U1 such the periodicity of U1 are different from the, yeah. I think it's, that's an example skip for the two plus one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so in yeah. axial scale, it's a specific symmetry. Probably. And the easiest way to count it is that that, that carofermia, the one plus three carofermia has charge and half. That's the easiest way. You can also count R versus even, but if we do a half. Mm -hmm. is there, because there's some lab in the upper the, the field, that there's another U1 such that U1 cover some of the U1. So maybe I should say, so this V spin C is sort of like a twisted, the spin C is sort of a, a twisted product of, well, it's a quotient of like spin cross U1 mod C2. And so you can realize that as um with this twisting and shearing that I think I will address later in this. In this presentation. So in the same way that you can realize pin plus is like a Z2 twisted spin symmetry, you can realize spin C as sort of U1 twisted. And I will say that more concretely with like a characteristic class example a little bit later. But I, yeah, I think it's, that's beyond said. But I wanted to just throw up some examples of um, character structures that were interesting. So now let's, let's get to the classification we're using. So let's fix the tangential structure. For example, let's focus on pin plus we've already discussed. Um, this is a definition in quotes since it's just a little fast, but um, in some sense, this Madsen Tillman spectrum, which is a spectrum in some sense is like a space or a sequence of spaces. Um, if you are familiar with Tom Spectra, um, this definition might be familiar to you. So. MTC is the Tom spectrum of the inverse of C. And I'm going to write this as B um, inverse C. So if we did this for pin plus, we would write the corresponding spectrum as MT pin plus. But that might be that might not be the most helpful definition. So let's focus on um, the idea, like why are we looking at spaces in spectra? Um, it's because we want to employ the ansatz of and Hopkins or a consequence thereof, which I'm going to phrase in this particular way since we're interested in anomaly groups. So what we're studying in this paper are anomaly groups of theories and say dimensions with certain types of symmetry, right? And so a consequence of Green and Hopkins and, and many, many others is uh, um, leading up to that, is that if I take a certain kind of cohomology of this spectrum, uh, this group that I get, this cohomology group that I get, describes or classifies these d-dimensional theories, or anomalies of these three d-dimensional theories. And so it's a certain kind of cohomology of MTC. The cohomology is defined using the Anderson dual to the sphere spectrum. That's this I sub C. I don't really want to say too much more about that, but maybe some intuition for why you would choose that um, is that if you make this choice, you have that your theory is determined by its partition function. But for us, let's suffice it to say that if I take this particular cohomology theory, apply it to this spectrum that classifies the symmetry that I'm interested in for my system, then I get the anomaly groups I'm interested in. But um, yeah, so for example, I'm three plus. If I look at, I think we discussed this earlier, we looked at the two plus one D minor on a fermion that will live in the fourth degree IZ cohomology of MT pin plus, that's 50 mod 16. Okay. There, so dually, if instead of taking cohomology, if I took homotopy of this spectrum, I would um, get a Bordism group. So this is the theorem of Contragon and Tom. And so if you've seen Bordism groups, you know that the elements of Bordism groups are classes of manifolds with particular tangential structure. And then I mod out by some equivalence relation given by um, Fordism. So for example, if I looked at second homotopy group of this spectrum, 
that's giving me the bordism group of pin plus manifolds that happens to be a Z2 and it's generated by the Klein model. So I said a lot on this slide and I didn't very precisely define mass and Tillman spectrum, but what I want to use is just that here's uh, the precise, well, here, here's what we mean when we write uh, this, and not this group of anomalies. And so there's a little bit of a, I believe there's a bit of an off by one uh, issue in our slides, but it should be internally consistent. So the takeaway from this slide is that I'm interested in Mads and Tillman spectra because when I look at their cohomology, their IZ cohomology, that gives us the group that we're studying or the, the group that we're studying in the context of um, anomalies. So, yeah. Right. What is the inverse? Is it like normal bundle inverse? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this inverse. Yeah, I guess additive inverse, but yes, it is a virtual bundle. It's a very okay. right. So now let's try to use this perspective that we can take cohomology of spectra to derive our log exact sequence. So what I want to put on the slide is okay, first of all, recall this notation, this mass and tilde spectrum. I'm also going to write it as the top spectrum of this virtual bundle minus C. Okay. So the proposition is um, that we have a fiber sequence of spectra. So again, this is sort of like a short exact sequence of spectra. So let's let this P be the projection map from the sphere bundle of row to this base space. Then the fiber of the map where we start with tangential structure C, we choose a symmetry breaking order parameter row. Um, and we form this map, which is dual to the defect map. The fiber of this map, or sort of the, yeah, the, the fiber of this map is a, is the pure bundle of row, and then we have to compute a pullback there, but I'll, I'll give some examples. So I'm using new notation here, SM sub row. We call this in our paper, the Smith map. And um, I think Asan Komargatsky and Thorgan also called it this. and. Um, we have a lot of uh, discussion about this in our paper, but it's for, for the purposes of this talk, um, you can view it as being the map that induces the defect map. And this map really comes from taking the zero section of rho. So if I just, um, if I have a map, if I just had a map from B to B, uh, to the top space of rho over B, this map would be given by taking the zero section of the of row considered as a vector bundle. And so what this map is, is just sort of adding on this um, auxiliary tangential structure in some sense. But it really comes from taking the zero section, which goes back to sort of what Leon was saying when he talked about anomalies on a defect. When you condense to a defect, it's sort of like taking the zero section. Okay, let me just give some quick um, intuition for like why I should think of a cofiber sequence uh, as a short exact sequence for like a quotient. And if I look at, I have a picture. So if I looked at the sphere bundle of row, that's going to live at the boundary of the disk bundle of row. And I, I guess I added on base points in here, but that's fine. And so the disk bundle is going to be contractible. But then the quotient, if I quotient out, here I'm looking at D2 and I'm looking at the boundary S1. If I quotient out that S1, of course, I'll end up with a two sphere. And so this would be what I get sort of for a trivial case. But if I kind of upgrade from spaces to spectra and I remember this auxiliary tangential structure that I want to keep track of, morally, this is sort of what's underlying this uh, fiber sequence of spectra. And of course, we go through the derivation more carefully in the paper, but this is the idea to keep in mind. 
So let's do some examples. So let me skip the second one. Okay. So if I'm interested in the running example where I start with pin plus and I choose my symmetry breaking order parameter to be sigma, the sign of representation, uh, the symmetry type that I land in is going to be spin cross C2. Let me address, I can address that in a minute maybe. And in this example, if I look at internal U1 symmetry, that would be the spin C symmetry. This course, this would correspond to using symmetry breaking order parameter I'm calling gamma. This is the total, um, this is the charge one representation of U1, and its associated bundle is the tautological bundle of U1. And in both of these examples, the fiber in some sense is not super interesting because it's only capturing the gravitational anomaly. I think, Dan, you said this a little earlier, like if you pull back gamma over B1 and compute the fiber from there, it ends up being, it ends up being um, trivial or, or contractible. And so I don't see any part of the U1 symmetry in this fiber. I just see this gravitational part or the spin part. And the same is true for, the same is true for this first example. If I pull back the sign representation, um, that's the, associated to the tautological bundle over BU1, sorry, BC2. And for the same reason, the fiber isn't super interesting. But let me give an example where the fiber is maybe a little more interesting. So if I take, now let's start with pin minus, this corresponds to a system with fermions with an eternal time reversal symmetry that squares to one instead of squaring to fermion parity, like here. If I take two copies of the sign representation, I now get something a little bit more interesting in the fiber. So I get some sort of desuspended or spectral version of real projective space. And this example will show up again at the end if I have time. Okay. Actually, the need to yeah. some yeah, oh, sure. Maybe one slide over here. Just make sure. I think there's uh, some sub index S scroll plus. Just yeah, I, I, so I guess I wrote plus to denote taking a disjoint base point. Um, that's not super important right now, but I guess we, we wanted to do that to help upgrade to spectra later. So it's, it's not super important. Uh, the idea I wanted to get across is just this picture, but it means taking a disjoint base point. So, okay. So what I have tried to argue so far is, okay, anomalies, which we're interested in, are classified by this group. This group is the cohomology of some spectrum. If I have a fiber sequence of spectra and I take cohomology, I get a long exact sequence. So I've described to you fiber sequence of spectra. If we apply the ansatz and take cohomology, that's what gives us the symmetry breaking long exact sequence. So this was a high level overview. There's more details. Um, okay. So much. Take your time. Okay. Well, I'll talk about, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go in order. So let's revisit now. Okay, now so now let's say how do we apply how do we apply this long exact sequence? So let's revisit this defect anomaly matching we saw earlier. So a question we had is how do you actually compute defect anomaly matching maps? When are they injective, surjective? What is happening for these maps? So for example, let's let's see the running example of pin plus and spin cross C2. And we've seen that several times now. But knowing the groups, even if we knew all of the groups of anomalies here, that's not enough to know what the maps are. So for example, if we have to specialize in D equals three, this um this this map runs from Z8 plus Z to Z15. We don't know what that is. It could it could be the zero map, it could be zero on the first component and projection mod 16 on the second component. Knowing the groups isn't enough, and knowing that it's a map of groups is not enough. So Hassan Komorgatsky and Thorngren studied this example as well. Um, they, by checking some choices, you know, with some carefully chosen generators, they were able to show that this map turns out to be 
um, taking eight comma beads at U minus two A. And I think Brian talked about this precise example earlier today. Um, so here this B is tracking the gravitational anomaly and A is tracking the internal Z2 anomaly. And so there's some interesting physics that we can deduce by knowing precisely what this map is. We know how the, you know, the anomaly content of the bulk and the defect match. But we wouldn't know that until we know what the precise map is. We don't know that from the group alone. So how do we get the map? So here's the example I just mentioned, degree four. And let me just write some other examples in various dimensions on this slide. So here's the defect mapping, matching maps in low dimensions for these two um, symmetry types for this setup. Like I, I'm not sure whether this map, for example, is zero or mod two. But once I use that I know what the fiber is and I know what the how to complete the long exact sequence, and I fill the groups in, then I can deduce uh, in most in, in many cases exactly what all of the maps are that I'm interested in. So since I know that this group is a Z, given that I know that this the computation of this anomaly group, and I know that overall I have a long exact sequence, I know that this piece doesn't split off into a short exact sequence. And knowing homological algebra means I know this has to be a times two and this has to be a mod two. So indeed this math is not zero, it's mod two. Um, similar argument here, I know that C2 has to include and then object, similar here. And again, I can use homological algebra to know that this map is indeed um, indeed the, the map on the previous slide. And I don't have to know what my manifold generators are. I don't need to check things that carefully. I can just use homological algebra and you know, know that I'm looking at a short exact sequence in order to deduce what this map is precisely. So that's kind of a useful tool. I'll go to the next application unless Sorry. there are any questions. Yeah. Did you explain that? Yeah, yeah. So are you trying to say you have a way to look at this map so we can derive what the, the previous slide while Ryan talked about this movie? So, so you know the, the map is what you say about the Z, Z times mm -hmm. Z plus Z sixteen mm -hmm. was given by the previous slide. Yeah. And what you're trying to explain, you can derive that. Yeah. Here, just here. Yeah, you can derive that here. So I guess you see that you know that this Z is mapping in. Sort of have a short exact sequence here. You know that the kernel of this map by exactness has to be a Z. So that's um not already going to mean that you want this projection, this sorry, this part from the Z A to the Z sixteen to be injective. And you can kind of bootstrap from there to, to deduce what the map should be. So you see that that part should be like a one mapping to two. Um, as it said here, plus minus two. And so you can deduce it from that. So it takes a little bit of like homological algebra or like using exactness, but. Uh, but do you need to connect everything in the moment that sequence or? So the. Yeah, sorry. So I, the, the things that are not connected, um, you have to deduce by exactness that they, those maps are zero. So I didn't want to go through every part of this. Yeah, so there's the deduction right there. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so I didn't draw an arrow here because the map is zero. And similar for some other ones, but maybe in this case you need to very slightly harder. Um, yeah. Okay. So I, I think I can see from physics side why the map goes like that. Mm -hmm. the, the, the size earlier. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's it. Okay, great. So next up, let's look at the second application of computing anomaly groups or dually computing bordism groups, which is of independent interest. So Long exact sequences can aid in anomaly group computations. Specifically, I'll do an example where they solve an extension problem for us. So let's just recall, I'm gonna use the word Smith map or the map that sort of dual or induces the defect map. And similarly, bordism groups are dual to anomaly groups. So I might use the word bordism instead for the rest of this discussion. But okay, let's do an example. An example of how we can compute a group of interest. So let's say I wanted to compute sigma twisted bordism of RP2. So this showed up a little bit earlier and I'll point out where that came from. And let me just quickly say that 
for examples, for other examples of using the Smith long exact sequence, you can see Arun et al.'s paper um, where they study the swamp land cohort conjecture and they use several, um, they use this computational tool several times to deduce some groups of interest to them. Okay, but let's see, let's focus on this example. Okay, so let's revisit this Smith map. Where we look at two copies of the sign representation. This goes between theories with pin minus symmetry and with pin plus symmetry. The fiber sequence inducing this had this non-trivial fiber. And to fill in the long exact sequence, we needed to compute this group. So this cohomol, sorry, I'm going to do it on homotopy. So this homotopy group of this third spectrum is going to be what I try to compute. So Kirby and Taylor studied this same situation. And they observed that if I take a degree two map between the sphere spectrum, so you can think of that as um, the sphere in various in various dimensions. Um, if you take a degree two map of that, sort of the cofiber ends up being a copy of RP2, which is, I guess, sort of intuitive if you wrap, um, you form RP2 by attaching a cell by map two times. And okay, they, Kirby and Taylor, show that this induces times two on spin boardism. So they study the situation where they look at a sequence of groups, they know one of the maps is times two. And they're interested, or let's say we're interested in computing this third group. If you use their setup, where you know these, these groups, I guess the same group twice, and I know that this maps at times two, then I can make limited deductions about what this third group is. So I can see that this maps at times two, okay, the, the co kernel has to be a C not two. And uh, similarly, Sort of down here, but if you go through an argument, you're unable to resolve this last group. So this group could be either C2 cross C2, or it could be a Z4. And it's not clear from this approach which one it is. It's not determined. So now instead of doing this, let's use the symmetry breaking, breaking long exact sequence, the Smith long exact sequence. So there again, it was going between pin minus and pin plus. And so now I fill in those groups of anomalies. So that's a Z16, okay. Now I can complete the long exact sequence. And it turns out using this long exact sequence, I can now deduce that the group I wasn't sure about before happens to be a Z mod four, because I know I have a short exact sequence splitting off where I have a, a group A mapping to C mod H and mapping to C mod 2. The kernel of this map has to, um, has to live in C mod 4. So it's not necessarily, it's not that the symmetry breaking long exact sequence is more powerful than other techniques, but when you are computing anomaly groups or computing bordism groups, it's very helpful to have many different techniques, because different techniques would be more useful in different situations, and so they will complement each other. So we're advocating for um, using the Smith long exact sequence or symmetry breaking long exact sequence as one of those tools in your toolkit for computing groups of interest. Question? Yeah. Uh, yes, maybe so. One is just a rotation question. I think yeah. Maybe two sides only you have some omega with the tilde on the top. Oh, that's, that's uh, reduced. I have not been very careful about reduced versus unreduced. Uh, let's see, that up here, here. Yeah, yes, the, yeah. Uh, this is uh, reduced. reduced. So like, so the same, this, in the same sense as like ordinary homology or cohomology, like reduces where I sort of um, take a relative to the point. And okay. yeah. And, and I didn't explain sort of how you go from RP2 to RP1, this twisted version, but I, I can say a couple words about that if you would like, but yeah, I, I think it's fine. So the, the takeaway is just that this is an interesting group fitting into our uh, 
long as x equals describing some anomalies, describing some phys physical process. And if we want to compute it, um, the long exact sequence is a really helpful tool because from this original approach, we don't know this group. And from the symmetry breaking long exact sequence, we can very easily see what this group is. So it's a helpful tool. And okay. I'm sorry, I mean, actually, yeah, so, sure. uh, I mean, actually, can you explain that uh, the previous known long exact sequence mathematician really use? We cannot derive certain. Um, group, but using the symmetry breaking on the sequence, you are able to derive it more naturally. What, um, what I'm trying to say is we're we're not the first by any means to study Smith, like what we're terming Smith maps, or or I'm not sure if you have also studied like Smith long exact sequences, but we study them in a very systematic way and collect um, collect many examples and give a formalism for it. And what I'm trying to say is that using that formalism. Um, is, is a helpful tool among many other tools that people would use to do computation. So in this particular example, it turned out that this long exact sequence was not sufficient to determine it. And our the long exact sequence we study is. I'm sure there's other situations where our long exact sequence is not determined and like you would want to use other approaches, like looking at manifold generators using the atom spectral sequence. But um, using long exact sequences is very nice because if the homological algebra works out, it's a pretty quick computation. Thanks. So the last thing I can talk about is twisted tangential structures and shearing. I'll just return to this if anyone has any questions, but um, let me let me conclude here and say thanks for coming. And if there are any questions? There's one slide you skipped and you can this one? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So on this slide, I'm trying to address the question that came up a little bit earlier, like what's this G sub rho, this like twisted symmetry? And so on this slide, I talk about how to understand spin structures that are twisted by by um a pair of a space and a vector bundle over it. So the precise definition is that if I have a vector bundle or more generally a virtual bundle, an X comma V twisted spin structure um, on some other vector bundle over M, for example, the tangent bundle of M, means I need to have a map from M to this space that I'm twisting over, and then a spin structure on the sum. So maybe the vector bundle itself isn't spin, but once I add on this auxiliary piece where I pull back this V, then it becomes spin. So here's two examples. So we've been talking throughout the running example about pin plus structures, and we can realize those as BZ2 comma sigma twisted spin structures. So BZ2 is the classifying space for the group Z2. It looks like RP infinity. And sigma is the sign representation. It looks like the tautological bundle over RP infinity. And so one can, you know, you have to prove this, but pin, pin plus structures are equivalent to BZ2 comma sigma twisted spin structures. And we use that when we are computing like this map of spectra, like we, um, maybe I don't have it. Yeah, okay, so here's, if I write out the spectrum MT pin plus, that's gonna be equivalent to MT spin smashed with this Tom spectrum of three sigma minus three over bz2. So I just subtract three to make this dimension zero, but but the idea is we use this and have we use this implicitly throughout the talk in order to recognize uh, interesting structures as twists of spin borderism. And you could also do this for um, any other things like BSO or um, string borderism, et cetera. And I uh, you can just if you want to check this, you know, the obstruction to pick plus is W2 and on the side, um, this spin structure you can realize is on this bundle plus three copies of its determinant line bundle. Okay. And just similarly here, like spin C is a twist of um, is a twist of spin boardism with respect to the tautological bundle over BU1. So this is something we've kind of been using implicitly throughout, and I just wanted to make explicit like how that comes together. Thanks.
Comments from the also from the online audience. Any questions? Or comments? Aaron, Aaron's and Ryan were online audience. Aaron still live here. If Aaron has any comments, you can feel free. <laughs> Thanks for the nice talk. Thank you. So, so thanks for seeing the uh, camera first. Thank you. Thank you.